So good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming on a cold night. Um, my name is uh, Mark Kayanja. I'm a spine surgeon with uh, Wright State Orthopedics. And I'm going to be giving you a talk on uh, common spine conditions. I'm going to be talking about the adult spine. We won't be talking about the pediatric spine. I don't have anything to, to disclose. We won't be talking about anything commercial or anything like that. So starting at the top, um, talking about uh, cervical degenerative disease. We'll talk a bit about um, anatomy, evaluation, imaging, and some of the, I'll show you some pictures of treatment of some of the conditions. Now, one of the important things about uh, degenerative disease is sometimes you have an appearance that looks pretty on the x-ray. It looks pretty involved. However, if the patient does not have any symptoms, we don't treat the x-ray, we treat the patient. So some of the studies that have been done um, have shown, um, looking at Lawrence et al., um, a lot of patients, if, if you did a study of 100 people, you'd find a lot of radiographic changes. But just the presence of radiographic changes by themselves do not need, necessarily need any form of treatment. And as you go up in age, the changes that you see on the MRI or on the X-ray um, increase. And you can see here in this study by uh, Bowden here, MRI evidence of degeneration um, in, in males over 60, 60 years of age and in females over 50 years of age. See that in about 90% of the population. So radiographic features do not necessarily indicate treatment. Treatment is based upon the symptoms. So some of the risk factors for uh, degenerative disease are smoking, frequent loading, um, high-risk occupations, um, previous lumbar surgery. The cervical spine and the lumbar spine tend to be um, connected in that way. That things that sometimes happen in the cervical spine also happen in the lumbar spine. Uh, and then other illnesses that you could have, for example, kidney disease. And, and then you can have other things like um, the amount of space you have available. Um, some people are born with naturally small uh, spinal canals. And people with that condition are more prone to develop symptomatic uh, degenerative disease. Um, other possible factors are vibration, previous trauma, uh, gender, and uh, familial disposition, and race. Um, so the natural history is, is about 95% 95, 95 of men and 70% of women aged 60 years and older have at least one level of degeneration. Typically, the level of degeneration tends to be the highest, the, the area with the most motion. And that tends to be about C5-6. Um, located in the cervical spine. Um, patients who, de who do develop symptomatic disease, um, a lot of them will be able to be treated uh, non-operatively and the condition, the aggravation will improve over time. About 32% of those who get affected who have symptomatic disease will end up having persistent symptoms which may need to need further treatment. The important take home message is whenever you have symptomatic disease in the cervical spine, more than 50% of patients will get better with non-operative treatment. So some of the, the continuum of symptoms that you have is you have the degeneration with neck pain, typically just neck pain, or you can have 
you can have a disc displacement, uh, you can have a radiculopathy, all that means is you're just having pain down a distribution of one of the nerves in the arm. Um, then you can also have that from a, a, a soft disc or from a bone spur, what we call an osteophyte. And then you have the silent disease, which is the disease that causes narrowing of the canal and the presentation that the patient has is of progressive weakness, progressive difficulty in ambulation, numbness in the hands, and that comes from spinal cord compression in the neck. So you can have, uh, just like I was mentioning, you can have direct mechanical compression. Uh, you can also have inadequate blood supply. Um, this typically you present with difficulty with ambulation. You lose the ability to, um, one of the issues is handwriting deteriorates, difficulty with uh, dressing and fine motor function. In the later stages, you can have bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, but the thing is myelopathy, the stenosis where you have the spinal cord being compressed, it may be painless. So the typical assessment for someone who has neck pain or arm pain is you're going to get a history. Um, the physician is going to ask you how long this has been going on, the location of the pain, what type of quality the pain is. All that helps us to evaluate what the problem is. Going to do an examination tailored to seeing if you have any weakness, uh, any of the muscles that are being innervated weak, and if there are any changes in sensation. Um, then laboratory studies are typically tailored according to what you present with. And then the, um, the, the most important is the imaging, which is usually consists of x-rays. Um, if you have um, something that precludes you from getting an MRI, then you may have to get a CT with a dye in it. Uh, and then the MRI is the mainstay. So x-rays are shadows of bone. They help you to be able to, um, to see what's going on. The MRI helps you see the nervous tissue, the nerves and the spinal cord to allow you to see where and if there is any compression. Um, some additional things that can help are uh, electrodiagnostics, um, where they put needles on the arm and they test to see which muscles are functioning. They can use them also to assess whether there is n involvement uh, of the nerves and where the compression is. One of the things that can be um, deciphered out is you may have a carpal tunnel syndrome and that can be seen on the EMG, which is the uh, electromyogram. However, the limitations that you have from this is if something has been going on for a couple of days only, you may not have the changes necessary to see any changes on the EMG. The mainstay of treatment is non-operative treatment, just like I had mentioned before. The majority of patients who have neck pain or arm pain are, are most likely going to get better over time. So rest, um, use of soft collar, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like Aleve, Brufen, if you're able to tolerate them. Um, sometimes a short course of steroids um, through an oral uh, dosing. Um, Medrol dose pack is one of the examples where you start off with a higher dose and the dose is tapered off over a couple of days. And then physical therapy is one of the mainstays of treatment and uh, manipulation therapy. If the non-operative treatment fails, that's usually over a period of at least six to eight weeks. And if the symptoms are persistent, um, if for example you have persistent or recurrent arm pain, or if you present with weakness, one of your arms is getting progressively weaker, or you're having a poor response to the non-operative treatment, uh, depending upon what your imaging shows, you may be a candidate for operative treatment. The operative approaches to the neck um, can be divided into those from the front or those from the back. Um, 
whatever condition you have precludes which approach will be used and what the goal is of treatment. But the basic um, premise is wherever there is compression, the goal is to take that compression off the nerves or off the spinal cord. And if there is instability or if the decompressing of the nerves is going to cause instability, then you'll do a fusion as well. So the fusion is, is where you use bone to bridge, to join two vertebrae together. And in the modern day spine surgery, you usually use adjuncts, which means screws, rods, plates to achieve that fusion. So here are some examples. Um, you can see over here, this is the, uh, that's a um, side view of the neck. And you can see this is the spinal cord here. You can see there's really a lot of compression right there. Uh, and these are the views, the axial cuts, which are going to be the transverse sections that you can see. And you can see how much compression there is right there. And that corresponds with that region there. And that was treated by doing a decompression, taking the pressure off. And that necessitated going from the front, uh, putting in bone graft and putting this plate to bridge the gap. Another example here you can see um, due to the degenerative disease here you have the spinal cord here, the space available here. When you compare this space up here with that space there you can see how narrow it is. And because of that, and this was done from the back. So front back depends upon what the condition is and what the goal is of treatment. And one more example here, you can see several areas where there is compression. This compression is coming from disc. These are the discs, the vertebral bodies are here. The discs are in between, and you can see the discs are bulging backwards. And this is the spinal cord here, and you can see the areas of pressure right there, the so-called hourglass deformity. And that was treated from the back opening up the spinal canal. So moving on from the neck down to the back, um, there's many causes for back pain. Um, some of them are arising from the muscles, from the fascia. Uh, fascia is just the investing tissue covering. Uh, we have the discs that I had mentioned before. In between each of the vertebral bodies, there are discs. The wear and tear of everyday life and what you do causes um, small amounts of trauma that cumulatively cause degeneration over time. And this leads to uh, what we call degenerative disc disease. There are also, we're going to be looking at that in more detail later. There's also two other joints at each level, which are called the facets at the back. And those can also undergo degeneration, and they can cause other symptoms that we'll look at. Then you also have osteoporosis, which, is, which means when you have bone mass dropping down, and you have the architecture of bone being disrupted, and then you have an osteoporotic fracture. That can cause uh, back pain as well. And then the combination of degeneration can lead you to have uh, deformity. Then there are other things, infections and things like cancer that can cause problems. So lumbar degeneration tends to be universal. Nobody tends to be immune from it. Different people have different amounts of degeneration and different people respond differently. Some people have a lot of degeneration and no symptoms. Some people have a small amount of degeneration and a lot of symptoms. And there's a variety of clinical presentations that you see from this. So going on to explain what we call the three joint complex. This is uh, what we call a vertebral segment, which means two vertebral bodies. There's a vertebral body here, vertebral body down here. There's a disc in between, uh, the, the nerve roots occupy the spinal canal, which is in there. This is the spinous process that you see, spinous process. And this here is what we call a facet. There's a facet joint. So the facet joint 
is located at the back, and it, you have two facet joints, a left and a right. And all these surround the exiting nerve. So you frequently have probably heard about sciatica. When you have one of the nerves in the, in the low part of the spine, when you have a disc which is very close to the nerve root, you have some portion of that disc coming out and putting pressure on the nerve, then you have pain shooting down the leg. There are other things that can happen here which can give that similar um, presentation. For example, the facet joint which is right here. Um, so just for orientation purposes, the front of, of the person is up here and the back is here. Then this would be left and that's right. So the nerve that comes out here is surrounded by, there's the facet joint at the back and there's the disc here at the front in front of the nerve. We're talking about the nerve, not in relation. To, this is all located at the back of the body. So this intervertebral disc has, has a structure. It has a, a, a center which tends to be more fluid than the outer covering. The outer covering is like the layers of a tire. And you can have this nucleus, the nucleus of the disc, can come out, and that's what we call a disc prolapse. It can come out through cracks that develop in the wall of the disc, and that's what we call a prolapse disc. So the degenerative changes that we're talking about is when we're young, we start off with what we call tall discs. So even prior to this stage one degeneration, you have a, what we would call a normal disc, which tends to be a tall disc. As you go through the stages of degeneration, what you see is the height of the disc there in stage one versus stage four. The stage four disc is much narrower there than it is up there. This has a significance in, in what we're going to see later in terms of what happens when you get pressure on the nerves. So basically, as this is an age-related phenomenon, wear and tear causes these changes to occur. And the different things that you see is you see reduced disc height, you see bulging. Um, I think it's one of the common things that we hear about. Oh, I have a bulging disc. Someone tells you they, they have a bulging disc. You have elevated periosteum. Periosteum is the covering of bone. Uh, one of the functions of periosteum is to lay down bone. And the way that the bone spurs form is when you have this periosteum raised, it forms extra bone underneath it. So that extra bone then ends up forming what we call an osteophyte or a bone spur, which gives that appearance of a bird's beak. So this, you can see, is um, a relatively healthy disc. You can see more degeneration there, and then this is advanced degeneration there. So um, looking at this three-joint complex, this is an MRI that shows you different amounts of degeneration. As we had said before, the degeneration tends to happen at areas which have the most motion. Most motion tends to be at L4-5 and L5-S1. Those are also... So um, the, the uh, lumbar spine has, normally has five vertebrae in it. This is the sacrum. This is L5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. That tends to be the lumbar spine. So the spine is cervical, which is in the neck, thoracic, which is in the thorax where there are ribs, and then lumbar, which is below the ribs and above the pelvis. So when you have these degenerative changes happening, you can, if you look back to this spine there, and you look at this, you can see we normally expect the spine to, to be relatively straight. But as these changes occur, the changes may occur more on the left side than on the right side. So you have, for example, more collapse on the left side 
that will mean that the spine then undergoes this progressive curvature. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens over time. And you find the development of what we call a scoliosis. A scoliosis is simply a curve of the spine to the side. So the factors that affect the, the, the spine is upright posture, the mechanical forces, the structural changes, the spinal alignment. Uh, one, of, one of the important things in, in a spine surgery and in spine health is maintenance of alignment. One of the problems that you get into, we're going to be talking about osteoporotic fractures later, fractures due to osteoporosis, is the fracture causes you to lose height and the height typically then causes you to lean forward. So as you get more and more fractures, you keep going forwards. That means you lose your alignment. And that then puts extra stress on the other structures like the muscles. And the muscles have to work over time to keep you upright. The goal of the spine is to really focus, is to center your head in space so that you're able to look upright without any stress. If you're leaning forwards, it's very difficult for you to see the horizon. And then that can give you neck pain, that can give you back pain. When you're leaning forwards, your back muscles have to work overtime to keep you straight. That gives you back pain. And one of the things you do is if you're leaning forwards, um, what you do is to counter that is you can flex your knees to help you stay upright, but then that's going to give you leg pain over time. Because if you do that for several hours, it's quite painful. So um, back in 1978, a gentleman, these two gentlemen called Kirkaldy Willis, they described the, what we call the degenerative cascade. Um, and that's basically, they looked at, um, they looked at the spines, they looked at radiographs, they looked at um, specimens, and they saw over time the type of degenerative changes that would occur, and then they classified them into stages. And that was the, that's what's called the degenerative cascade. And you have disc degeneration, then you have osteophyte formation, then you have stenosis and deformity. So just going back to what we had talked about before, we're now looking at a spine from the back. So just imagine that you're looking at someone from the back, but you've been able to take all the flesh off. You'll see the spine, and you can see there's, these are the facet joints. So there's one on the left and one on the right. So these joints are different from the intervertebral disc, because the intervertebral disc, just like we saw before, has some fibrous tissue in it, together with a, a more fluid nucleus. The facet joints are like knee joints. They have synovial fluid in them. They have a capsule. So these joints, just like hips and knees, can undergo arthritic, arthritic changes, and you can have arthritis there. So this can then cause other problems that we're going to see as we move along. So you can have a synovial re uh, reaction. You can have fibrillation. All these are just the changes that can occur in other joints like hips and knees. So going to this degenerative cascade that we're talking about, so what you have is the disc develops fissures. As you can see, there's a fissure there. And you can see the circular layers of fibrous tissue with the more fluid nucleus. When you have these fissures developing, you can then have some of this nucleus can push through a fissure and come out. That typically tends to happen when, um, when you hear uh, patients describing it, they say I was maybe bending over, picking something up. That tends to cause, as you're leaning over, 
as you're holding something in your hand, you're loading the spine, and then by bending, you, you stretch this out here, and then that allows that piece of material to come out. As you see here, you can see the herniation or pushing out of this tissue here. This may come through the annulus or it may just bulge the annulus. And then you can see here progressively, you can see that comes out. And the nerve root is pretty close to that. And then that would be responsible for you developing pain shooting down the leg. You can see uh, once again how the disc height here, when you compare the disc height with that there. Now that hole that you see there um, in this cartoon here, the nerve has been taken out, but the nerve does come through that. And that's, we call that a foramen. That's just an exiting area for the nerve. So as the disc height reduces, the space available where the nerve exits becomes smaller. And then that can also result in you having pain radiating or going down the leg. The other aspect of it is osteophyte formation. You remember we talked about periosteum. Periosteum is the covering of bone. When that covering of bone is raised, its function is to form bone. So if you raise it up, it will still continue to form bone. So it forms bone that is extra and looks like I liken it to a bird's beak. So previously, your vertebral body came straight down like that, but then because the periosteum has been raised over time, you've had extra bone form, and then you have what we call an osteophyte. This is not so much a problem if it happens in front. It does become a problem when it happens behind here because what is in this foramen or exiting space is the nerve root. And the nerve root is what innervates your legs. So when the nerve root is compressed, it can cause weakness or it can cause sensory changes, pain, numbness, tingling, any of those sensations when this type of thing happens. Then once again, facet degeneration. We did mention the facet joints. They're synovial joints, just like hips and knees, but they're smaller joints located on the spine, the left side and the right side. So you can also have those affected by arthritis. And the nerve root comes out right through there. So when this happens, the nerve root is in close proximity. So as a result, the nerve root can be irritated by that. So there's a combination of factors that can lead to the symptoms that you have when you have back pain or leg pain from degenerative disease in the spine. You can see that the nerve root is right there. And you can see how the nerve root is being irritated by a combination of factors. So um, the disorders that we see um, can have degenerative disc disease just causing you to have back pain. Back pain not necessarily with, it, with any leg pain. You can have stenosis. Um, stenosis just means narrowing. So the space available for the nerves is now narrower than it used to be. One of the things that presents is pain with motion. So you're walking from here to the parking lot. You develop a lot of back pain and leg pain. You sit down and rest, the pain goes away. That type of pain is what we call claudicant pain. That just means pain that's arising from stenosis. Because of the changes that we've described earlier, those changes cause narrowing. So there's not enough space for the nerves. And because the space is limited, with increased activity, for example, walking to the parking lot, your nerves need more blood supply. However, the space is limited so they don't get enough blood supply. So it's, it's similar to if you had 
a blood pressure cuff on your arm and you left it on for a period of time, your arm ends up feeling numb and painful. So how does this present? This can present with back pain. This can present with pain going down the leg. This can present with what we call neurogenic claudication. That's what I was describing earlier, which is just simply the pain that you have from spinal stenosis. It can also present with inability to go to the bathroom. And it can also present with postural imbalance. Um, one of the things that happens when you develop stenosis is when you lean forwards, you tend to feel better. So one of the typical questions that is asked is, when you go shopping, do you use a shopping cart and you lean on it? Because what happens is, as you lean forwards, the vertebrae move in such a way that they open up the spinal space slightly more. So you feel better when you bend forwards. And that's one of the things that can happen when you have spinal stenosis. So you tend to want to lean forwards as you walk because it feels better. So stenosis, once again, so this is looking at it. So the same models that we've been looking at, this is now we're looking from above, looking down, or as is the um, looking from below, looking up. So you can see this is the space available in here. This is the front here. This is the back. This is the right side, and that's the left side. So we're looking up. And this area in here is where the spinal nerves course through. You can see that this area is already narrowed, significantly narrowed. And it's being narrowed by these are the facet joints here, facet joint here, and this is the disc in front there. So you have bony spurs being formed from the disc. You have arthritis in the facet joints. And this combination of factors narrows the space available. And that narrow space there is what we call stenosis. So once again, explaining that, you see the arthritic changes in the facet joints. You have osteophyte formation. And you have, uh, there's ligaments which are within the spinal canal. Because there is significantly more motion, you remember we talked about discs getting narrow. So things become lax. So the ligaments get thicker in an attempt to maintain stability. The thickening of these ligaments, they are within a closed space, is further going to compromise the available space. So other things that can happen that we did mention is you have, once again, if we remember, the disc has that outer covering, which is similar to the layers of a car tire. You can have disc material coming out and protruding out. This is the MRI, which is the transverse cut that you can see. The spinal nerves are back here, and you have this piece of disc which has come out from in here and is putting pressure there. So that can cause pain going down the leg. And if this is significantly large enough, it can also put pressure on these nerves and can affect things like bowel and bladder function. So this is once again recapping that same nucleus that you see coming out between fissure and coming out at the back. This, this tends to be um, in the third to fifth decades of life. And it, there's, we, we, we never say never, so to speak, but it, as you get older, you don't have as many, the disc herniations tend to occur in younger patients. So the other thing that can happen is we've been talking about disc height. We talked about a younger disc is taller. The older disc loses height, part of the degenerative changes that occur. So one of the things that can happen is you have the de degeneration in the facet joints. Remember, left and right facets, those degenerate. 
So the weight of the spine is carried by the disc here and the facet joints at the back. When they undergo degeneration, you can have a situation where one vertebra slips on another. And this is what we call, it's a slip, which we call, it's just a doctor's term for slip, which is spondylolisthesis. Spondy is vertebral body or um, spinal segment, and listhesis just means slip. So it's just a vertebra is slipping on another. So this happens because of loss of disc height. Um, the disc, just like we mentioned before, is just like a punctured tire. So as it loses height, it then becomes lax and can allow motion. You have facet degeneration. The facet joints tend to be oriented in a way that they stop the spine. They're oriented this way. So they're like this, they're like stops. So when they undergo degeneration, they can allow the spine to slip forwards. So this is what you see happening. As one vertebra slips on another, once again you see the nerve which comes out in that exiting hole or foramen, and you can see what happens to the nerve as that vertebra slips. The slip it may not be that drastic, it may be just a couple of millimeters, but that is enough to narrow the space available for the nerve. So, uh, then lastly we have the uh, scoliosis, which is that curvature, the curvature to the side that can develop. So then, moving on, I wanted to talk a bit about osteoporosis. Um, so, osteoporosis is defined as a condition where you have reduced bone mass. So, one of the things that happens is, typically in your second to third decade is when you have your, what we call peak bone mass. That's when your bone has the highest amount of calcium in it. And then over time, you progressively lose bone mass. So this shows you what normal bone looks like and this is what osteoporotic bone looks like. So when you lose bone mass and you lose connections, there are these, this is a microscopic picture of bone, but when you lose these connections in between um, the bone cells, the bone becomes more fragile. And that's how osteoporosis then allows fractures to happen. So they typically are not the high energy type of fractures, somebody involved in a motor car crash or something like that. They tend to be fractures that may involve, I was bending over, I was lifting a 10 pounds bag of rice or something, I felt a snap in my back, immediately had pain. So the activities which you normally were able to do because you've lost bone mass and because the bone is not the quality that it used to be, it's no longer able to support the same loads. So when it's subjected to the same loads, it ends up fracturing. So um, osteoporosis, decreased bone mineral density. Uh, bone mineral density is just a way that we use of measuring bone mass. The trabecular bone, as you can see, this is normal on this side, this is osteoporotic. It has lost its interconnections. And what the body does over time to try to account for this is enlarge the vertebrae. So the vertebrae tend to enlarge in size, and that's one of the ways of trying to counter the reduction in strength. So there's basically two forms, primary meaning um, it's accumulative loss from age and the changes in the hormones. And then secondary means you have some other condition which is complicating the bone metabolism so that you're losing bone mass. Um, it's, it affects more than 10 million Americans. Um, 
and the estimate is 14 million by 2020. Um, the magnitude of this problem is because the fractures that happen due to osteoporosis tend to be disabling. They have significant ramifications. Um, uh, there's an estimated uh, 547,000 per year, and this was just from 2007. And 73 percent of the fragility fractures are not in the spine. There's a lot of medical visits, a lot of hospitalizations, and the estimated costs for this uh, problem, um, 17 billion, that was in 2005. So it's, it, it is a significant condition, a significant condition that we see in the hospital, and it does affect um, a lot of people. Um, the, one of the biggest concerns is what happens to you after you get a fracture, because the fracture tends to be um, one that causes you to be bed bound, at least initially, until the fracture can either be fixed or you can be treated. And it is that period of immobility which leads to further problems. So the vertebral compression fracture, or which we abbreviate as VCF, um, leads to pain, leads to height loss, the height loss that I was talking about, and leads to kyphosis. Kyphosis just means forward bending. The studies have shown, yes? A vertebral compression fracture. So um, when you get one vertebral compression fracture, there's a 20% chance of getting another one in within the next 12 months following that. So uh, once again, just going back to peak bone mass. So you get your peak bone mass, and then what you do does affect it. That's one of the reasons why we encourage exercise, we encourage, we discourage smoking, um, because those factors affect you when you start losing your bone mass from age 30 onwards. Um, one of the determinants is, of course, heredity. Um, there are other factors that are involved, um, physical activity, um, the more that you keep moving, it's, it's kind of the rule, use it or lose it. Um, smoking tends to have an adverse effect on bone mass. Uh, this is just to show the importance of calcium and vitamin D. Uh, they do play a significant role in bone metabolism. And uh, we do recommend um, supplements with calcium and vitamin, vitamin D. It's just showing you, um, just want to go on to the strength of bone. So the relative strength of bone is determined by, so bone tends to be, it has the outer shell, and then it has inner, what we call bone marrow, or that's trabecular bone. So the combination of those two it determines the strength of the bone. So. There is loss of both cortical and trabecular bone in osteoporosis. And that combination of loss leads to the reduction in strength. So that's, this is just going back to the vertebral compression fracture. Causes pain, causes height reduction. That's the forward bending. And there's a five-fold risk of a subsequent fracture, 20% of patients who get an index fracture or get the first fracture will suffer another fracture in the next 12 months. And then a subsequent fracture then aggravates all those complications that happened before. Um, one of the ways of measuring uh, bone mass is through the DEXA scan. And the DEXA scan gives you what we call a T-score. And the T-score is just simply the number of standard deviations. So you take your bone mineral density and compare it with a standard. And then the number of 
so they get they use a mean so how far you are from the population mean tells you whether you're osteopenic or osteoporotic or normal um, so there's not enough people being screened because one of the ways of finding out about osteoporosis is through screening um, screening is have a DEXA scan done and then that can help you to know because what the best way of of treating a compression fracture is by prevention uh, who should be screened um, <coughs> screening parameters vary but um, 65 years or older uh, bone mineral density at or below treatment threshold or if you have a family history of having compression fractures would be uh, reasonable for you to have your uh, bone mineral density measured. Um, there are other risk factors. Um, those are risk factors. Family history, um, sedentary lifestyle, we encourage exercise, poor nutrition. Um, so the poor nutrition is going to be simply you don't take in enough. It's important to have the calcium and vitamin D. You do have calcium coming in through um, dairy products, but that may need to be supplemented as well. So if you do have poor nutrition, that means you won't be getting enough, and then that will lead to um, loss of bone mass. Uh, scoliosis, um, uh, women with scoliosis are at risk for developing osteoporosis. Prevention, um, once again, um, weight-bearing exercise, aerobic exercise, uh, vitamin D, um, calcium. Uh, there's medications that are associated with osteoporosis. One of the most um, significant is the steroids. Um, some people have to be on steroids because of their medical condition, but people who are on long-term steroids are at risk of developing osteoporosis. There are also other, med other medications that you can see here that can also predispose you to developing osteoporosis. And then treatment, uh, once again, vitamin D, um, calcium supplementation, and then also, um, typically as spine surgeons, we don't delve into the pharmacologic, the administration of, for example, the bisphosphonates. We leave that to the family physicians or the endocrinologists who are, who are managing that. And we encourage patients who have vertebral compression fractures, who we see for the first time, who we may need to treat operatively, and we have them follow up so that they, we ensure that they do get uh, this treatment. Um, so there's various treatment options. And I think those that are most n notable are the ones that have been commonly talked about, like the uh, Fosamax and so on, with all their attendant um, side effects. And I think that's it for, for now. Um, any questions? Yes. So the question is, is patient has had a laminectomy, is there anything else that can go in and open up the nerves? Um, so the laminectomy, if we just go back a couple of slides, let's see. So um, when you do a laminectomy, what you're basically doing is this is narrow, so you come in surgically, so that means you make an incision on the back, and remember this is back, this is front, um, left or right is there, and you come down, and this is the lamina here, so there's a lamina on this side, and there's a lamina there. So what you're doing is you're cutting through there, and you're cutting through there, 
and you're taking that piece of bone out. That creates more space for the nerves in there. So there are different ways that that can be done. Um, the traditional way it's done is through an incision. There are other ways that you can do it through using what we call mini minimally invasive approaches where you use a, a tube. So you make an incision, drop a tube down, and then you operate through the tube to achieve the same result. Um, the results tend to be um, about the same. The minimally invasive procedures tend to cause you um, less blood loss and faster recuperation. But the studies have shown usually at about the two-year mark, everybody does about the same. So in terms of if you do have known compression and the compression, your symptoms have not responded to non-operative treatment, the typical non-operative treatment modalities are probably spinal injections, um, anticonvulsant medication like neurontin or gabapentin. Um, if it has not responded to any of those means, non-operative, and the decision has been made to do it operatively, whether you do it through an open approach traditionally or through a minimally invasive approach, the outcome at two years is going to be about the same. Right. So there, there isn't really, if you have proven stenosis, which has not responded to non-operative treatment, you just need to take the pressure off those nerves. Any other question? Yes. So there are two types of specialists dealing with back. One is neurosurgeon, another is orthopedic surgeon. Can you elaborate what's the difference between these two? So the question is, is there's two specialists dealing with the spine, neurosurgeon and spine, uh, sorry, and orthopedics. What's the difference between the two? So I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. So the traditional difference is orthopedics is more of the musculoskeletal, whereas neurosurgery is more of the brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves. The standard for spine surgery is usually completion of a fellowship. So whether you do orthopedics as a residency or you do neurosurgery as a residency, if you're going to be practicing spine surgery, people usually do a fellowship. And that fellowship is one year of dedicated spine surgery. It, it could be an accredited or non-accredited. So there are programs that are combined. I went through a combined program where we worked with both neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons, all of those being spine surgeons. There are some programs that are predominantly neurosurgery, and there are other programs that are orthopedics only. Um, but pretty much these, when, whenever you come out of your fellowship, you're pretty much all you have. There's a basic fund of knowledge that is similar. The neurosurgeon is different in that the neurosurgeon can also deal with um, stuff that's in the brain. And the orthopedic surgeon is different in that the orthopedic surgeon can also deal with, for example, hips and knees. But there is a common, um, uh, uh, let's say, a common um, fund of knowledge that the spine surgeon has, whether they be through orthopedics or through neurosurgery. Yes? Another question. I do have that pitched forward uh, stand that you talked about. And I, uh, when I'm in a, in a uh, supermarket, so I do push the cart and I find that good. Is that okay to do that? Is it, I mean, should I be trying to stand up more erect or is it, does it make a difference? So the question is, is he has a pitched forward um, posture, and when he goes to the supermarket, he leans on a shopping cart. Is that bad? Um, 
you lean forwards to make yourself more comfortable. I wouldn't say that's a problem because leaning forwards makes you able to achieve what you want to. The problem comes if you're going to progressively keep falling forwards um, when you're unable to look at the horizon. That's when it becomes a problem. Um, you may have falling forwards may cause you increased back pain just from the posture. It may also cause you hamstring tightness. But it all depends upon um, what the underlying condition is and at what point you are. If this is something that you're able to live with and that's acceptable to you, you're able to function that way, there should be no harm in it. There are actually some, there, there is a device um, which uses that same principle. Um, you insert it surgically and what it does is it opens up the spine at one level or you can put it at other levels as well. But what the principle is, is it causes the spine to locally at that level that you've operated upon, it causes it to lean forwards and in so doing you increase the space available for the nerves so that you allow the patient more relief from the symptoms. It's an interspinous device, that's what it is. Yes? You said as you get older, you don't absorb calcium as well. And I'm wondering, you know, um, are there things you can do other than that? You take vitamin C with it and that stuff. What, is there anything you can do? Or how do you know whether you know, you really need to do something in addition to get more calcium. Our question is, is as you get older, um, what happens to your calcium absorption? Is there anything that you can do uh, to improve that? Now, if we just scroll forward to... Okay. Probably this one here. So... So the role of, looking at the role of, of maybe it's this one here. Which is, so you have, there's this 7-dehydrocholesterol which needs to go to cholecalciferol, vitamin D2. This goes, this is in the liver. And then you have an interaction between this vitamin D and calcium. So several things affect your calcium. So it's not just the amount of calcium that you take but it's other things in, that you're eating in the diet. I would say one of the things would be, first of all, to find out what your bone mass is. Because what your bone mass is is probably going to determine whether you need to be on supplementary calcium or whether you need to be on, because the, 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 the calcium that you need to take is going to be determined. The average value is the 1.2 milligrams, uh, sorry, the 1.2 grams that I had put up there. But it depends on what levels you have. For example, if you have um, a bone profile done, that would most likely be done by your primary care physician. If they determine what your levels are, that's going to be what would drive how much you need to take. These figures that I put up are not applicable necessarily to everybody, they're just general figures. So there's always an individually based, um, based value that you need. So if you have a lower bone mass, you probably need more. And it's not just the calcium alone, it's the calcium and vitamin D which work together. How do they measure the bone mass, did you say? It's through the DEXA scan. Oh, through the DEXA scan. Yeah, the DEXA scan, which then gives you a T-score and that T-score is what tells you whether your bone is normal, whether you're osteopenic, which is just, um, and then osteoporotic. So they, it's, they measure standard deviations or how far the mean is from the population. Yeah. Yes? I was sent to a team building class and suffered in an accident. You see the way I'm sitting in this chair. I essentially went straight down when I woke up, a 
across the lumbar spine, I told the instructor, it felt like I'd been hit with a, a piece of wood back here. I used to be able to run up and down stairs, now I barely crawl up and down stairs. Is that perhaps a symptom of uh, stenosis? So he was involved in an accident where he sat down very hard very hard, and developed pain in the back. The question is, is, is this due to stenosis? So I don't know if you had any, did you have any studies done at no. that time? No. Um, you know, I, I used to be able to ride a bicycle. I need to have my knee replaced. I can't do the full turn. And I have very tight hamstrings. They're like rock sometimes. But the main thing, the prime notice, I used to be able to sit on the floor, lean, stand up. Now I have to use my hands to stand up because my legs are weak. So that could be, it's, it's difficult to say what that is, but that could be one is when you have that type of accident, you can injure your facet joints. If you injure your facet joints, that can give you back pain. And that back pain tends to be worse with extension. That can give you, because of the reflex spasm that you have in the muscles in the back, mm -hmm. that then affects your posture, affects your ability to move your back, and can also give you leg pain. I don't go to the Kroger's and lean on a shopping cart. I lay down on it <laughs> and walk around, literally, mm -hmm. laying on the top of the cart because my back hurts so much. So the other thing that can happen is if you have that type of injury is you can have what we call a traumatic disc herniation. So you, for example, if you fall a particular height, you could get a fracture or you could get a traumatic disc herniation. What that does is it's going to, it goes into the canal, into the spinal canal. Um, if we go back. So it would come out, go into the spinal canal, depending upon how much it narrows it, it can then give you pain, it can give you weakness in the legs. Um, the other alternative is you could, have, you could actually have had a fracture, and the fracture could have, one of the things is we looked at the vertebral body, uh, let's see, so the vertebral body is, is, is almost, it, it has this um, shape to it, but when you get a fracture, you can have this collapsing. You can have part of the vertebral body collapsing. One of the things that that does is it gives you a lot of pain, and then you're unable to stand upright, and you tend to want to fall forwards. And then at the same time, that affects how much weight you can carry with your back. A lot less. So it, it, it really depends on what the imaging shows. Yes. Is there any effect of the type of the bed people use on the health of the spine? Like some like very firm, some sleep on the floor, some soft. Is there any any truth to, to this? The question is is yes. what does type of bed have to do with spine health? I would say the most important thing with a bed is if, for example, you had scoliosis, scoliosis just means your spine is no longer straight, it's curved. If you try to sleep on the floor, that would probably be difficult because you, your spine is abnormally curved and the floor is straight. If you had, for example, forward bending of the spine, if you tried to sleep on the floor, that would be pretty painful because if you're sleeping on your back, you naturally don't want to completely straighten out. So if you're lying on, it's very uncomfortable. So I think a bed needs to be, I would not say like a hammock that you just fall into that. It needs to be firm to a certain degree that it's going to give you the support that you need. The, I think the most important thing is what you use in the bed that you use. For example, if you put a pillow under your knees, 
you're going to take the tension off the hamstrings. That makes it more comfortable. If you're, li if you're sleeping on your side, you put a pillow between the knees, that helps you. You may also need a pillow, a small pillow if you're sleeping on your side for the neck so that you're not lying like this. Because if you sleep the whole night like this, you may wake up with arm pain. So it's really how that bed is used and how what your spine condition is and what you use in addition to the bed itself, like the pillows that you use. For example, if you had neck pain and you put three pillows there and you slept like this, that's probably not a good thing because you may wake up with arm pain. Because sleeping like this in, in a lot of flexion, when you have degenerative disease in the neck is not good. Any other questions? Yes. Do you, do you think those uh, memory foam mattresses have an advantage? You know, if you have a bad back or something? Our question is, is, does the memory foam help? How good is the memory foam? I think the memory foam is good if you, if you have, I've often had patients, because patients have told me about some of the problems they face. Patients who, I'm going back to the patient who's bent forward. When they try to sleep in a regular bed, it becomes, it's a problem for them because they have to put a lot of pillows to prop themselves up. The memory foam is good for them because when they, sleep on the memory foam, it creates that impression of the curvature of their spine, which then makes it much easier for them when they're sleeping. For somebody who has, it may not be as effective for somebody who has a reasonably straight or a reasonably normal spine. All right, thank you very much, and have a good evening.